Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Rittenhouse Astronomical Society, um, probably the oldest astronomy club in the nation. Uh, my name is Ted Williams, and I'm the president of the society, and um, we have our members signing on right now in the background, and this is our monthly live event. Um, the monthly event is, uh, for those of you who are new with us, we do this on second Wednesdays. Uh, we went to second Wednesdays because as we used to meet at the Franklin Institute, I believe that was our pattern going on some 20 years there. So it, it's kind of a little bit of a tradition. So second Wednesday, and uh, that doesn't mean we won't do more events in the future. So before we begin tonight, I do a little bit of formality. When we were in the Franklin Institute, we had a gavel and a clapper and we would start our uh, monthly meetings, which we've now turned into these Zoom tube events. So. Uh, this officially marks the start of the May 2020 meeting. Uh, welcome, everybody. And um, I'd like to um, start with something I did maybe about three or four years ago at a meeting. I put a call out, and the call out was for our members to step up and get involved. And it was a special project at the time. We wanted to get them involved to be telescope operators. And these were people who had come from our society and our society normally meets at the Franklin Institute in the Fells Planetarium. At the end of our meetings, we would go up to the rooftop for the Bloom Observatory. But the Bloom Observatory also had other nights a month that it was open and they were in need of staff. So we came to the rescue. Uh, we had, I believe, some 12 volunteers step forward, and along with another 12 that they already had on staff right there, um, we were filling out somewhere about, mm, I'd say, four, sometimes uh, a, with a special event, five events or five evenings in a month. And um, it was an amazing way to get to meet to know some people. Um, at one of these call outs, I had a new member, Lou Catabiano, was in the audience. And I had no idea. I had met him, but did not remember him. And um, I put this call out. And a year later, I'm at a training session at the rooftop at the Franklin Institute. And there's Lou standing right there in front of me. And I thought, wow, how neat. I, I saw him in our planetarium, and here he is on the rooftop. And I didn't know that he had signed up, become a member, was impressed by what I had said, and stepped forward and wanted to do some service. So we were looking at Saturn that night. And if I get it right, Lou, I remember Derek was doing a little training with us. Folks, Derek was our speaker last month. And um, we were looking at Saturn, and Lou stepped up to the telescope. And I saw one of those mouth drops, like, wow. And I knew it was a first light for Lou to see Saturn through a telescope. He hadn't seen it before. And he was really impressed, and rightly so. The refractor that we have on the rooftop gives an amazing view. But I always have a sneaking suspicion, so I made sure I stepped up after Lou. And if I got it right, Lou, I remember I tweaked the view on the telescope ever so slightly. And I asked you to step up again and take a look at the view of Saturn. And as Lou looked the second time, I got an amazing learning experience because I watched the second, wow, because now he could actually see the detail of the ring almost going behind the planet and coming back around. It taught me one thing. Um, when I'm working with the public, not everybody is always seeing the best view, but sometimes when it's a very first time or if they've never had the experience before, it can be a very memorable experience. At least I had the uh, wherewithal to get up and not say, oh, Lou, that was a lousy view. Take a look again. I didn't want to ruin the double wow that night. So I'm going to put the call out again tonight, everybody. And the call is going to be a little bit different. The call is going to be an observer and, uh, to either assist or help us run the telescopes at Muddy Run Observatory. I've recently put a proposal at the observatory. Um, we've joked at this and called it our solar bubble project. What we're really talking about is a COVID bubble, meaning a safe group, and that would be self-defined by the people who come out. We're going to see if we can't set up small safe groups and do an hour tour of the nighttime sky. So now's the time once again to put the call out. We have opportunities for those of you who might want to operate a telescope or those of you who might want to assist in doing some project like this. So you can always get in touch with me offline. You can get in touch with me right here. In fact, let me show everybody right now. We do have a chat function. So I'm going to go into the chat room and I'm just going to say hi all and I'm going to put that out and we don't use this that much, but that should have gone to everybody. 
So you can actually reply to anybody. And if you have any questions during Matt's talk or even Denise or Dave's talk, you can always put a question right down there in the chat room. I can't guarantee that we're all looking at the chat room. Sometimes we're really busy with our presentation, but at the end of our talk, we can look over and get some idea of maybe some questions that you have. There's also a way that where it says from me to everybody in your chat room, you can also chat to people privately in there. So if you needed to just talk with me and you say, you might be interested in coming out to be a telescope operator. Uh, that way we can keep it private between us and I can get in touch with you outside of this meeting environment. So uh, with that as kind of our opener for our May meeting, this is what we do. We're astronomers and we do some astronomy. Um, by day, we have all different jobs and careers, but by night, we're secret astronomers. And um, many of us do this as a passion. So what I wanted to do is I'm gonna turn it over to Lou first today because um, I've been asking people in our club if there's anybody they see interesting, or if there are people that they think are really noteworthy to bring to attention in our society and, and that we can enjoy them too, I encourage them to reach out to them. And then normally I say to them, well, then we'll get involved in the background and we'll, we'll set it up. Uh, well, Lou reached out to get this one together and Lou's not in the background anymore. I'll give him a little bit of an introduction too because he stepped forward a little bit with Rittenhouse also. He's working with your executive officers and in the background, we're redesigning our website and we'll be probably posting a new one shortly, uh, probably at the beginning of the summer. Um, we're trying to figure out ways to transfer URLs and I think it's all in good hands. So it's kind of interesting that I now already consider Lou part of the background operation here with us. So uh, thank you, Lou, for reaching out to Matt. And I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, first, uh, everyone, make sure if you ever meet Lou live, you give him a warm welcome because he's still one of our newer members, although he's been with us three or four years. Uh, the last year, no one got to meet. So Lou, you wanna take it away from here? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Ted. And uh, the kind of intro you gave to me about being at the Franklin is kind of timely and, and uh, relevant to my introduction to, to Matt uh, a little bit. So about... Honestly, it's been about 10 years, dude. <laughs> um, really? <laughs> about 2011 or 2012, yeah. um, I had a conversation with a random stranger on the street about a Star Wars book that I was reading. And this person said, hey, have you ever heard of this podcast called Star Wars and Character? Um, and I had not, and I checked it out, and I quickly became obsessed. And that is a podcast that Matt hosts with some friends of his, lifelong friends of his. And... I was really into the show. It was one of my favorites for a long time. And then as time went on, I wanted to kind of get involved. And I met them. They had done a fundraiser for Toys for Tots and raised $10,000 for Toys for Children. Uh, I asked to photograph them and became friends, eventually having my own show on the network that Matt uh, runs. And um, it formed a, a nice friendship with uh, a group of people and Matt in particular um, that has kind of lasted for a very long time. Yeah. <laughs> time kind of creeps by. Um, but one of the shows that Matt has done in the past has uh, been about uh, his love for rockets and astronomy and about, um, you know, he lives in Florida and he was posting these podcasts and videos about his experiences kind of watching rocket launches on the Space Coast. And uh, that is the main reason I asked him to join, other than the fact that he is a wonderful orator, even though he might not say so himself. <laughs> So everybody, uh, Matt Hunsworth of neazaz.com. Uh, Matt, please take it away. All right. Thank you, Lou. And if I'm not mistaken, that story Ted told about Saturn, I think you snapped a picture and sent it to me that night. I texted you because that I whole thing, like yeah, it. that whole thing sounded so familiar to me. So it's like, wow, this is, this is certainly a full circle moment. <laughs> yeah. Uh, full disclosure, Matt is originally from Pennsylvania and yes. now lives in Florida, but I had said like, Hey man, I'm pretty sure you've gone to the Franklin Institute before I'm looking through this crazy telescope. It's pretty <laughs> awesome. I think you'd appreciate this. Yep. We're all connected more ways than you'd ever. Ex <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> So, well, thank you. Um, first off, everybody for being here. Thank you, Ted and Lou, for having me here. And I am going to talk about um, podcasting and creating shows at and in conjunction with Kennedy Space Center a little bit, mostly through the kind of some storytelling, like the story behind the story. So I do have a presentation and I'm going to attempt to share, I believe. The screen is now sharing, and now I just need to start my presentation. So 
Lou, if you can give me a thumbs up if you see the presentation screen. Perfect. Okay. So I called it Fan Driven Media and Opportunities at Kennedy Space Center. And that's that's the the rough guideline of what we're going to be talking about. So first, I kind of want to talk about what I mean by fan driven media. It's already an archaic term in new media. It's more being called content creators, especially around here. Like Lou had said, I now live in Central Florida, Orlando specifically. I'm surrounded by theme parks. I'm surrounded by so much to do and so many people that just like to share their passion in doing it. And the term is turning into content creators. And, and it's something that's that's finally being taken very seriously by these very big companies. And um, kind of a little spoiler alert looking ahead, NASA, Kennedy Space Center were the first to kind of catch on to that. And I'm going to talk about that as well. And when I'm talking about these particular content creators, I'm talking about blogging and vlogging. YouTube, as I'm sure everyone is aware, is full of channels dedicated to very singular focused um, interest, including many things from NASA, Kennedy Space Center, SpaceX, and everything that's going on down here. I'm surprised there's not a, maybe I, I'm saying I'm surprised there's not a Blue Origin one, but there may be. I just haven't found it yet. Uh, social media and social media influencers like or, or hate them. <laughs> They're here to stay for a while. The trend is not going anywhere, um, but it is another group that's being creating content and being part of this, this new media. Special, special interest websites. Everyone, I think, on this call knows a lot of them. Space Launch Now being one of them. Space Up Close. You've talked to uh, Dr. Ken Kremer a couple of times. Both fantastic sites. They've kind of paid the way for special space interest people to be indie media people in this new format. And of course, podcast. That's where my focus lies. Um, I would love to vlog the way some of these YouTubers do, but I just, I'm a one man show. I can't just, I, I, I don't have the time or the knowledge or the skill to shoot that video and edit it. I would love to blog, but I just sometimes have trouble putting sentences together so I can talk as you're going to find out tonight. So I've gone with podcasts. Now my sporadic history leading into even wanting to do a any kind of spaced focused podcast really starts from as far back as I can remember. I have always been a fan of anything space. Uh, astronomy, space exploration was kind of my, my go-to thing. Um, anything that dealt with the up to the to the moon and beyond was just always an, a, of an interest to me. There's, I really can't think of a facet that wasn't uh, something I've always been interested in to the point that I've always loved rockets and the idea of space vehicles. And here's me at, I don't even know what age I'm going to guess four or five. Um, don't know how many of you would recognize that as the Steve Austin rocket that transformed into the Steve Austin operating table from the $6 million man toy line. But that was the toy. I remember having my whole life. And I, I do remember making it the operating table once and i had no interest in that and i've always played with it as a rocket and my mother loves to remind me of my interest for space every birthday and post that on facebook so this picture was really easy to retrieve once i moved to florida i've been here for about 23 24 years now i the second place i ever went when i moved into moved to orlando was kennedy space center the first was universal studios I'm going to admit that I'm a thrill ride junkie and I love movies, but the second place was Kennedy Space Center. And every time I'd go, I would blog and post and share every single aspect of that trip. I have tried everything. I probably have a dozen blog accounts on the various blog engines that have existed over the past 10 years that I just don't even remember the passwords to. I've, I've tried it, tried it all and finally narrowed my focus into launches specifically when wanting to do some kind of new media coverage. And there was a couple of reasons for that as well. Why cover launches? First, living in Central Florida, they're accessible. At the very least, if I am working or cannot get to a launch viewing site, I can step literally step out of the lobby door of my workplace, or I can stand in my driveway and still see it weather permitting. That's about the only limitation so that the, you don't get much more accessible than that as a new media production. They're fairly affordable, especially with an annual pass. The, the 
Kennedy Space Center annual pass is, I almost feel bad paying what little I pay for it. And then just the cost of a, if I want to go to a Kennedy Space Center or a NASA provision viewing area, it's, it's, there's an extra cost, but it's, it's, it's very um, affordable, especially for something we're crowdfunded, we're audience, we're 100% listener funded at this point. But when it was coming out of my pocket, the affordability was a super um, uh, attraction. It's not something everyone gets to experience, although I, I think everyone should. So I know there's an audience wanting to hear it when I had launched the show. And there is nothing like a live launch anywhere else. I, I, I kind of joked about being a thrill ride junkie, and I am. And I've been to literally theme parks all over the world. It's still the, the longest, fastest, highest roller coaster is nothing like getting hit by a wave of heat from a live launch. So that was something I felt I could share the experience with, with other people. Now, the range of opportunities at Kennedy Space Center, they're pretty varied, but they're, they're, there is something for everybody at every level, whether you're going to go out there and start your first show today, or if you have an established media presence, there is something there for everybody. And the first is the easiest thing. You buy a ticket and you make your own event. There's ups and, down, ups and downs to it. The biggest up is that you're free to cover what and how you want to an extent. You know, you, you, you can't buy a ticket and decide you're going to go to the administration building that's behind that security gate. But you can still, if you want to do it through picture telling, if you want to do it through videos, or if you want to do it through recording audio, you have the freedom to do that. You're not beholden to a company above you or to an agreement with um, whoever invited you to do it a specific way, which is nice. The downside, the limited access. You're not going to be getting that one-on-one -on -one interview with someone in particular that, that has to do with the event that you're at, but that can be okay and work in your favor, depending on how you want to pursue your end production. There are media, cover, media coverage invitations, which I have had done a couple. I've done more of the first example, but I've had the um, the pleasure, the, the um, I can't think of the word I'm looking for. I'll say the honor, because if I felt very honored to be an invited media guest. And again, you're free to cover how you want to cover that specific event, unless some limitations are, are laid out for you. Another big bonus pro to that uh, is more access and interview ops. And a lot of these you can set up ahead of time, or they are kind of, even to an extent, they are offered to you. Like the, um, I had an opportunity to talk to Charlie Bolden at one event. And uh, I, it was as simple as just be at this location between, I think like two and four o'clock. No, that's way too long, maybe two and two forty, things like that. So you're not going to get that by doing it on your own. So the media invite, and the, being in a media poll certainly helps. Then there is what I consider the pinnacle of an event. And this, the, the, there's so many fantastic things about this that it's going to be a, a, the kind of the third act of this conversation. It's called the National Social Program. And if you don't know about it, familiar, familiarize yourself with it. It is a full day to multi-day event and it is unprecedented access might be a bit extreme, but it certainly felt like it, it is certainly experience like nothing else and the best thing about this is is anyone can apply it, it the only qualification is a social media presence if you have a facebook twitter instagram tiktok whatever the hot thing is now you are open to apply I, there i think there's maybe a, a u.s citizenship thing on there too but it, as far as the technical aspect the media aspect of it anyone's able to apply and i'm going to talk about that too because the fact that anyone in all walks of life can experience what I did have the pleasure of experiencing a few years ago, everyone needs to know about this. But let's talk about covering a launch because this is a, it was kind of a tricky thing to um, wrap my head around because it's it, being a podcast, it's audio only. And what is there to hear if you can't see it, especially considering a launch is a see, hear and feel experience. Well, that is, I can express what I'm seeing, hearing, and feeling, but is that enough? And we'll go on to see how I went over that. There's a crowd energy, especially when in the public viewing areas. I'm not quite sure why I added that parenthetical there. I think maybe to pad out this, this um, frame a little bit, but it, there's always a crowd energy that is, you can describe it, but is it going to come across? 
turning all that into an audio presentation. How do I do that? So I have two examples of what I did, one that was very easy and one that was very difficult and two approaches that I learned a lot from in both and would have never and learned a lot and gained a lot of experiences that I would have never experienced if I hadn't embarked on creating some kind of media presence through this podcast. The first is the SpaceX CRS-10 launch. On the surface, this is a pretty standard launch by today's standards. It was a refueling supply. It was a half pressurized, half unpressurized Dragon capsule on top of an F9. That seems like it's happening almost every week at this point. But there were a few aspects to this that were worth talking about in a audio presentation. First, it was the first commercial vehicle launch from the historic launch complex 39A pad. And if you know your rocket history, that probably rings a bell. It launched Apollo 4. It launched a Skylab mission. It launched the Saturn 1 in the Soyuz project. It was the launch pad for shuttle STS-1. And also the launch pad for Atlantis's very last flight, which I believe is STS-135. So along with that, it was the first launch from 39A since the end of the shuttle program, since that retirement. And I believe, I didn't write this note down, I believe that was a six-year gap of anything launching from that launch pad. So it was a pretty significant event already between those two things. From the SpaceX side, it was the first SpaceX launch since the anomaly on LC-40. An anomaly is another word for an explosion. So right here, just to start developing the show and the idea and the experience, there's a lot to talk about with just the history of the launch pad alone. I did add some details about the Falcon 9. This was the full thrust configuration, so I explained what that was. But everything I just talked about and everything I just also had recorded in this past episode is something you can look up in a 10 second Google search. So why would anyone want to check out my show to learn about that? So let's take that to another layer. There are stories here that no one else is going to tell. First, that I was the first to arrive, which is something that never happens in my life. So for me to be on the Banana Creek bleachers by myself was a piece of audio that I will never be able to duplicate again. It rained while we were there. There is probably the most fun clip in that episode for me is my wife and I recording under an umbrella where you can clearly hear the rain hitting and her not happy that I took her along. My wife has a insane sense of humor, which if the more you get to know me, the more that makes sense. So that is probably my favorite bit in this entire episode. And on top of that, it was a cloud-covered launch. To this day, I have no idea how conditions were met for this launch. It was an instantaneous launch. It had to go off at the minute it was scheduled to meet up with the International Space Station, or else they'd have to wait till whatever the next launch window was. How on earth the weather conditions that day between the rain, the cloud cover, and everything else aligned for what I call the nine seconds of history is beyond me. and. I didn't grab a video of this, but I have a set of pictures after being the first one there. So you can imagine I was there for hours, sitting through some rain, thinking this launch is not going to happen. It all came out to nine seconds of the launch, hitting the clouds and disappearing. So that is another story that is not good. You, you might hear a blurb about that on the news, but you're not going to hear the entire story that leads up to that. So with this episode, this was a very easy episode to put together, and I and a lot of uh, fun experience went into this. The uh, I got a good look at the viewing area, being there by myself and not really being watched by anyone yet. Uh, the cloud cover, the learning about the instantaneous response or uh, launch, sorry, and kind of convincing myself it wasn't going to happen, and then finding out that not everything appears as it is when it comes to rocket launches and it somehow it still broke through the clouds and, and completed its mission. All things that I would not have gotten that layer of enjoyment and experience out of if I wasn't looking at this through the lens of doing the show. So 
I was very happy to put the show together. I'm very happy people downloaded and listened to it. But on a personal level, doing a project like this really enhanced the experience. And that was good knowledge going into the next example I have, which is the United Launch Alliance. I lose an Atlas V rocket of the Gozar project. This was the hard way to do it. But again, having gathered some ideas and some experience of how to look outside of just the launch itself, things came together. But first, let's talk about the launch and why it was so difficult. GOZAR stands for Geostationary Operational Environmental Satellite R Series. Okay, I learned that much. I also learned it's the next generation weather tracking. And then after that, that was where my brain went. What am I going to do with this information? So I show up, it was a, a dusk launch window for the start. So I showed up all day. It doesn't take much to convince me to go to Kennedy Space Center for the day. And luckily, ULA was present everywhere that day. And that is a, a picture of the pile of literature that I got to study exactly what I what, what this launch was about and why this launch was important. Particularly, I, I, I gained a very new appreciation for weather tracking living in Florida and always in uh, fear of hurricanes come the fall and winter season. So this this actually ended up being far more interesting once I delved into it than it was on the surface. Like I said, the launch window began at sundown. So that was something new. I'd always covered day launches up to then, not, not by choice. It's just how it happened. And another uh, story element fell into my lap. I met two gentlemen from Australia that were seeing their very first launch. And this was the last thing they were doing. They were going back to the hotel, maybe getting dinner, maybe going to a bar, but their next morning, they were getting up early and, head, and going to the airport. So this is the last thing they're doing. So now I have an interest for them for this to happen because I know what it's like to experience your first launch. To add to that end of the story, this launch went off at the last possible minute. Now, I found out later that this launch window, the best time to launch was either at the beginning or the very end. The be, in between those times were workable, but since they had everything fixed after the first hold, they decided to wait at the end. We didn't know that on the concourse. So I'm trying to convince these gentlemen that everything's going to be okay, thinking full well, we're all going home <laughs> disappointed. But it went, they were excited. I I I have clips of, of us talking. It wasn't a proper interview. More opportunity and more experiences that again would not happen if i didn't dive into this project and see a bigger world for the launch experience and to give kind of an idea of what a night launch looks like from the concourse it, there's really this is about as beautiful as it gets that you all you can see is the spotlight on the atlas 5 and then all of a sudden the entire launch complex this is lc40 lights up and then you can see that burn trail it feels like forever even when it goes out and your eyes trained on where it's going you can still see the glow of the engines at night out on the out on the uh, i'm sorry i said concourse i meant causeway out of nasa it's so dark out there i mean it's basically a swamp land you're fighting mosquitoes the whole time i'll give you that warning but you can see forever out there when these night launches go it's absolutely beautiful so all these different experiences have made each episode of Go for Launch different, even though they all deal with the same thing. They deal with me arrive. They deal with me actually setting up the idea of what the launch is about. Me arriving, me talking about the experience leading up to it, and then me talking about the launch and some thoughts after. But everyone is distinctly different because there's always something new that happens. Um, the 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 CRS ten and the Gozars that I. I talked about our two examples. The uh, Neural 76 was the first one I filmed from a place called Space, Space View Park, or not filmed, recorded. SpaceX CRS-11 was the first time the skies were so clear that we could see the booster land between the... We, not as close as this picture, but we could actually see the streak of the of the of the breaking flame between two of the buildings off to our right from the grandstands across from Banana Creek. Never happened before. Another great opportunity to talk about it on the show. It's just been, it's 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 um, 
really fun to find new things that you love by wanting to share the most you can possibly share in a format like this. And it, it could do the same thing with a blog. You know, I do even more with a video. The opportunity is there. And none of this, and none of my examples were media invites. These were all independently produced with the ticket uh, for the launch or going to a launch site. And, and believe me, um, Lou gave me a fantastic introduction, but if I, I say with no small, uh, mat, in no small matter that if I can do it, anyone could do it because I am, um, uh, until I'm behind the microphone, I am extremely introverted, bordering on lazy and always tired. So if I'm able to do these things, anyone else can do them as well. So now, um, I, I, another big benefit um, that I wanted to share, especially if you're ever in the Central Florida area and you uh, you, you need to see a launch, I was going to say you decide to see a launch. I'm going to tell you you need to see a launch. If you can't get to Kennedy Space Center, if you can't get a ticket, there are other launch viewing areas. I wouldn't have known about any of these if I didn't do the show because I wanted to find new places to record from. And there, just to name a few, when we talk about beaches and parks, these are the ones that have the better views but there's certainly more places to go than this but playa linda beach sand point park jetty park allen shepherd park there is a westgate beach which is a privately owned beach it's part of a timeshare don't let that scare you because you can go to the restaurant there and not <laughs> go through a timeshare spiel and get a drink and stand on their back deck and see a launch that's available as well um, oh, that's a shot from uh, Playa Linda Park. There's Exploration Tower, which is over by uh, the port, the actual port for Port Canaveral, where the ships come in. And to your, um, where this is the back of the building in this picture. If you looked behind you, you'd see all the ships in dock. Ahead of you, you can see the rocket launch. And that is a seven-story building, and their observation deck is out on the top for the launches. Another beautiful, unique perspective to see it. Then possibly the best, kept i don't know if it's a secret it's a it, it, I, i'm gonna call it the best kept se local secret to Cocoa beach and the space coast is space view park because there's a few reasons why first here is a shot of space view park on the marina docks across from i believe i think it's lc 39a as well that's a spacex rocket going off and that's the vab to the right of it this is the opposite perspective that you, you, you see from Kennedy Space Center. If, if, I, if you could walk through the water and keep walking, you would walk to the grandstands across the Banana River. It's free. It's a huge place. Here's a shot of those marina docks that you can walk out of. There's, I've never seen a boat in there in my life. I'm not sure why there's no boats there. It's always open. There's always tons of people on there. And my best kept secret is you, you can't, see it in this picture see if my mouse will come over you can't see it in this picture here but if you go to the left you're going to get to this dock no one ever goes there probably because it's not as close as these out here but it's shaded it's close enough and i've been there probably 10 times because i take friends there after we go to space view park after we go to kennedy space center I've been there 10 times, six times manatees have just swam up to see what's going on. So you get that whole experience along with the free rocket launch. And in fact, I didn't realize here, I didn't realize I had a picture of the sun bridge here. You can also stand on this bridge. There's parking at the front and back of it. And there is a, a walking rail here. So you can also stand on top of the sun bridge here for free. It, just got to make sure you don't block traffic. You'll get fined. And another unique uh, place to see this. But Space View Park, I want to talk a little bit more about because it's more than just this marina. It is a walk. It's, it's got the Space Walk of Fame, which I can't believe I lived here 10 years before I knew this existed. It's a walk. It's a, it's a, I think it's probably about six blocks of walking. And they have these markers for all four space programs, much like the Hollywood Walk of Fame. They have mercury gemini apollo and the space shuttle and at each kind of intersection are these monuments to the different programs with these each one has something different the the um, apollo one has a lot of jfk and a lot of the apollo program um i think the handprints are from the even though it's it's well buzz aldrin's done more than just the uh, apollo program but i i 
um, I think they're kind of all over. I don't think, I don't think they're program specific. I could be wrong. Uh, I always, always take a picture of something. John Young. I live off John Young Parkway. It's impossible. Oh, here. I'm sorry. Wrong. I'm searching the wrong screen. It's impossible for me not to capture something of John Young because I, I on his highway every day. He's a central Floridian or, or was he passed away a few years ago. And then the, the shuttle has this beautiful marble statue uh with a a side dedicated to every every shuttle it's this is this is even if you um like i said if you don't get to kennedy space center you can go to um space view park and if you don't get to the launch you still have this to experience it's it's an absolutely wonderful thing it's that nobody talks about outside of cocoa beach it's so bizarre and then as an added bonus to that, too, if you're into seafood, there's a place about a half mile away called Dixie Crossroads that has rock shrimp any way you can fathom it. And if you've never had a rock shrimp, it's like eating a mini lobster tail. So get yourself a bowl of butter garlic rock shrimp, and it's like you've eaten eight lobster tails. It's amazing. So the last thing I wanted to share with everybody, I, I mentioned this before, the NASA, NASA social program, um, nasa.gov slash connect slash social nasa social will get you to this this site that i like i said nasa picked up early early on that independent content creators uh at the time bloggers loggers and podcasters were invaluable to letting people know and letting different generations know what's going on in nasa and they developed this program and it is open to everybody you just need a social media account it can be independent any of you could do it on behalf of your of, of Rittenhouse Astronomical Society, as long as there's some kind of media presence to post things from that day on and hashtag, that's, that's the important thing it, when, when it's talking about Twitter and Instagram, you can apply for this. And I was, and this is not just, um, I'm going to be talking about one at Kennedy Space Center, I should mention, they have one at every, every NASA complex, uh, the, all the ones in California, the uh, Glenn Research Center in uh, Cleveland. Uh, the Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland, um, Johnson Space Center in, in Texas, of course, uh, Huntsville, Alabama, Hampton Roads, Virginia, uh, the Stennis Space Center in Mississippi, uh, Wallops Island, Virginia. We we're just talking about that before we get started tonight, the launch going on there. So they have them at all these places and anyone can apply and you don't have to live in that state. I've met Half the people in my group were from out of state. I, I felt bad when we're introducing ourselves and everyone's talking about their flight. And I'm like, I, I drove 40 minutes to get here. Don't hate me. But so it, anyone can apply and I encourage you to follow it. I will say before we get too excited is that right now with COVID protocols, they're doing everything virtual, which is actually a nice opportunity to see some really neat things. I have no doubt having worked with them and having followed the two gentlemen that run this, that the second they can have people in again, they're going to have it. So keep your eye on this incredible opportunity. And my incredible opportunity was the Orion EFT-1 flight in 2014. This really started my new media career with NASA. I kind of started, I peaked at the top and kind of clawed my way back after that, but it was worth every second. And I'm going to tell you what this particular NASA social event entailed. And what I've followed since then, I, I've introduced this to a lot of friends that I've met in new media over the past years through some stuff I do with theme parks. They've gotten and they've applied and invited, and it seems like it's gotten even better, if you can believe that. Day one, I started by picking up my credentials. I had to go to I had to go to a building that doesn't have an address. We were sent coordinates for me to put in my phone and find. It wasn't a secret. It just doesn't have an official address where I went and got my security clearance. That's what the yellow card was. And I also got my other uh, credentials for the event as well. This second picture here, this is where I parked. I just could, I've never seen the vehicle assembly building outside of a bus. And here I am, I'm parking not in front of it in its parking lot, but I'm getting out of my car and looking at it. And th that is my favorite building on property for so many different reasons. S this third picture, um, it's hard to tell, but I had gotten to the administration building that we were going to our first presentation at, and I had to walk along a balcony to get to the particular room we're going to. And I took another picture of the VAB because now I'm three floors up and I've never been three floors up and looked at the VAB before. I could not help but take these next two pictures because before I went in, 
it's a little workout area. It's like, I didn't even know this existed. And the fact that the running track was this space shuttle is like, I would give anything to work. Do you need some trim painted? Do you need the carpets? What? Give me something to do. Let me work here for a week. I want to do every one of these stations. Who knows? Who it was Story Musgrave maybe did some pull-ups. I don't know. I just, I'll just I'll let my imagination go wild. That's the morning. From there, I did something I never do. I take a selfie. I hate taking my own picture. I'll let Lou take my picture. He knows what he's doing, but I hate taking my own picture. I had to. How could I not being in a building I've never been in before with the VAB behind me? And then I finally walked into the room and we're going on TV. We're going on NASA TV, both the cable station and the streaming station. And there's monitors and cameras and lights and there's feeds from all over the place. And my wife took this picture as it's going on and sent it to me. I believe we figured out Oh, I can't even tell anymore. I'm, I know I'm on this side somewhere. She saw me and I guess just grabbed the uh, best picture she could. I'm over here somewhere. I know I had a blue shirt on from that. And then Charlie Bolden spoke to us and Bob Cabana and then Rex Corvan, the astronaut with the coolest name on the face of the earth. They all talked to us. Let us ask questions. This is the unprecedented access I was talking about. We had uh, like a good three hour broadcast with them, which is still online. I did not have the nerve to ask a question. I'll be honest. I wish I did. I regret, I regret that, but I don't regret going. So that's our morning. And from there, oops, went one too far. From there, we go into a building next to the VAB, which I can't even remember its name. And there is um, Brian Duffy, another astronaut, telling us about at the time, which was the, the, the start of the space launch system, which we've had some test firings of now as well. And and I think I think there's some some um theoretical dates for some launches not mistaken i'm not sure so we're learning about the space launch per, uh, system right off the bat from an astronaut unfortunately i couldn't take any pictures of this i went into the neil armstrong operations and checkout building which had a ton of things headed towards the iss in it but where no photos were allowed i didn't mind in the hallway they had this banner that was going to be that was going to go along the whole grandstands of the launch it that has employees sign it but they invited us to sign it which i did that's my chicken scratch right there so somewhere on nasa property is this banner with my signature commemorating the orion launch so oh, from there um we finally met orion it's on top of a uh, delta four and we had this this great group picture i do know where i am here i recognize my sunglasses <laughs> that's i'm always in the back because i'm a little shy and i'm tall so it's easy enough for me um these are this is the entire group of the social um what 100 ish people not very many for something like this um great story here uh as you can probably guess this this gentleman lost well over 100 pounds i think his lo weight loss was in the hundreds and he was that was his social media presence and he takes his old pants with him everywhere super super nice guy made a lot of friends here night great group of people small group of people spent three days with them on the same buses over and over again it's hard not to get to know some people so that's the end of, oh, it's not the end of the day one. I'm sorry, because we could talk to Tori Bruno from the ULA as well. And Elmo, usually something I don't get excited about, but it's it's Elmo. Everyone knows who Elmo is. So I think that's the end. Okay. Day two we was supposed to be the launch. And I, I, I grabbed this picture. There are thousands and thousands of people along the causeway and on the other side too. Look how much space is between me and the next guy and how much space is in between this. This NASA social thing, they treat you like royalty, I guess. I don't know if that's the right word or not. I could not believe we had this entire space to ourselves. And most importantly, we had our own facilities as well, which was nice. Uh, you don't think about that until you need them. So the launch actually got scrubbed that day. So they said, well, we'll go take you to take a nice look at our brand new digital countdown clock which we did and i got so close that i could even take a picture of the generator that i was running it because the power wasn't even running to it yet little things like that i nerd out on uh we also went inside the vehicle assembly building i have been in the vehicle assembly building i'm, I'm still a little kid i'm getting all excited i have been in the vehicle assembly building before um when the shuttles were being retired they were, they were actually doing tours but i've never stood in the middle of it and took a picture of the highest point of the building until this day that's what this picture is it's doesn't sell that well as that's what it is, but that's that's what's happening there. Um, that's the crawler. I'm sure you all know what the crawler is. That I am like looking up and could 
well, I couldn't reach up. I, they're, they're, they're too high. I felt like I could reach up and grab the exhaust pipes. I know the treads on this are huge. I never realized how huge they were until I'm standing maybe five feet from this yellow line. Unbelievable what this social program offers to, again, everybody. And then to top things off, they're like, well, we don't have anything else for you. You have to come back tomorrow. Why don't you just go hang out at Kennedy Space Center with John McBride, the astronaut, for the rest of the day? So <laughs> it's like, okay. Which, by the way, I've now learned, I think John McBride is like always there because I've seen him at Christmas. He said Merry Christmas to me. And I've actually seen him on an episode of All Things Bar Rescue when they're rescuing a bar outside Kennedy Space Center. So I think he actually lives down here, which is awesome. Super nice, approachable gentleman. And he will tell you stories if you ask him day three we finally get to the launch and beautiful sunrise morning beautiful uh position for me to take a picture and that the launch went off and this was the the my first real and best see hear and feel moment because you did see that giant flash of the ignition you saw the liftoff i'd say right about when you got to where this first exhaust plume is you could hear it and when when you're looking up and following that that burner that's when you get this overwhelming like giant engulfed hug of the heat from the launch it is Amazing. You get it with the SpaceX ones as well. Those are a little smaller and a little farther away, but this was, this was the, the biggest experience of that I've ever had. And I'm very nostalgic for this moment that I go to the NASA now portion of Kennedy space center, which is the extension of their IMAX theater now. And I go see the Orion capsule because it's on display there now, because I was there, I was there part of that, um, beginning of a new history and new um i think uh i think the announcer called it a new generation of space exploration so uh, i i always go out of my way to to see it just kind of kind of relive everything i went to uh, there was so much to talk about um with those nine to ten hour days that it ended up being a three episode uh special that is still online if you ever want to hear it i had so much to talk about and i brought a friend on who's equally as enthusiastic into space exploration and rockets just so he could ask questions that because my memories are are one thing and and i'm kind of reliving it if it was that things weren't clear he could ask questions and it was a very thorough recap and very fun and he was very bitter because he wasn't there which actually made for a fun conversation as well um getting to the end here there are ups and downs of doing this by yourself biggest up especially when it comes to space exploration and nasa and kennedy space center there's always opportunities there's always something of uh, something new to discover a new perspective to talk about things and a new way to present them there is that you get out what you put into it um i have lapsed in episodes uh in recent years and i don't get that call from the media pool anymore uh, again, going back to uh, Dr. Ken Kremer, great site with Space Up Close. He posts every day, sometimes multiple times a day. He probably doesn't even have to worry about letting them know that he exists. He's probably on a media pull rotation, and deservedly so, because he has put more into it than I have. And when you don't do that, it's a constant hustle to remind them that you're there if you want to be part of that, which is something that I have a love-hate relationship with. And it's all down to what I put into it so that I'm the only person to get into the love hate relationship with it has nothing to do with them when you do it by yourself and you're doing it independently and you don't have a big corporation behind you prepare yourself for limitations and adjust and adapt and have fun with it that's that's easy to do with something you love there's no rules on how when and what to cover when you do it by yourself either which apart from legalities of course so that's that's a great thing to approach this with too. just realize you don't have any restraints on yourself because you're not answering to anybody but the biggest downside of doing it independently and doing it by yourself is you can't do it all and that'll lead to my last very brief story the very first falcon heavy launch i mean how many of you have seen this and i don't need to see you because i know you're all raising your hands none of us missed this how many of you 
saw this on this rural road on the way to Enola in Oklahoma with a server in your rental car pulled over to the side of the road with a spotty cell phone connection trying to watch this. I'll put my hand up because that's my story. I had a ticket for this. I was ready to go. I was not going to miss this for anything except when it came to my job and my career being on the line. And I had to go to Oklahoma to fix a severe problem. And this is what I had the YouTube, the SpaceX YouTube channel on my phone the whole way. The signal was going in and out. We got to about six minutes to launch and I had a signal on these rural roads and I pulled over. No one ever passed me. That's how rural it was. And I was watching it with my phone in the air thinking I'm actually getting closer to a satellite signal somehow. And I watched it. I still enjoyed it. I got goosebumps. Um, the, the, the picture was so bad. I didn't realize the screen said, don't panic till I watched it in a hotel room later, but still I saw it. I got the experience. Now the ticket was not refundable and that doesn't bother me because Kennedy space center. I don't know how many people know is not government funded. It's, it's independently funded. So I felt like I gave him a good donation, but it was transferable. So I gave it to a friend who loved it so much that he at least bought me a hat. So I had something to walk away from it. So it wasn't a total loss. So um, that's it. Um, just want to say um, the show is called Go For Launch. It's still on iTunes. It's still on the website. It is transitioning with COVID. I didn't realize how much I actually missed launches until I couldn't go anymore. So I'm like, now that it's I'm being denied, I'm really missing it. But that's now changed. I want to relaunch the show, but I don't want to wait for a launch that I can make. So I'm rebranding it soon as a space fans podcast. And I'm doing things, a very nostalgic look at things when space launches aren't happening. I'm going to recreate the drive-through experience that Kennedy Space Center was in the early 60s when it first opened. I actually own the Time Life record set of the Apollo missions they were selling in the 70s. I'm going to talk wow. about those. I have some news albums that were sent out to independent or uh, to uh, like uh, public media back in the day and just discovered my wife was cleaning out some things from her mother's house and found out she had the moon rockets and missiles Viewmaster slides. So I'll be talking about those. So the show's coming back. I'm still going to cover launches, but some more nostalgia and fun things there. That is it. Thank you everyone for your time again, go for lunch, going into space fans podcast and everything at news as.com. So I did see alerts on the screen, but I could not figure out how to read the questions as they were coming. So uh, don't, no, I'm they were happy, all, to, happy to do it now. Cool comments. No, they were all cool comments. Oh, great. Okay. About it. Uh, people were just remarking. I think you hit a nerve when you were sharing the rocket toy with a couple of people. <laughs> nice. it, just that there are rocket toys to things like that going on. Okay. This is amazing. It's amazing that you were able to get all that done. And uh, the, the connection with Ken Kremer, uh, that, that blows yep. my mind. Ken worked with us. Oh my gosh. He was a loyal uh, contributor and worked with us a good eight years when he was up here in Philadelphia. Oh, and wow. things, oh, that's things changed for him. He was yeah. in Princeton he, and um, uh, let's just say terrible way to have to retire. He was wow. in the pharmaceutical industry up here. And, and, and you know, the dilemma that we're all facing with uh, not enough vaccines, not enough needles, all that stuff. He told me that 10 years ago, he said that we've let go all the people who are doing all of the uh, manufacturing. Wow. Um, we're doing all that overseas. And he, he even said 10 years back to me, though, there's going to come a time we're going to be sorry. We don't have this workforce producing all the basics right here. Uh, he's an amazing guy. And yes, totally, totally devoted to rocket launches. Yes, he, he is. Yes. I he, love it. I love his, I love his site. I, it's so ironic um, that it was a site I've been following. And then um, Lou had, inter, uh, had asked me to do this, introduced me to you, Ted, you sent me some links and I was like, wait, this all sounds familiar. And I couldn't believe it's the same guy. <laughs> and I have talked to, I, I unfortunately I can't remember her name. The, the woman he had brought on at the end, I have talked to her. Uh, Jones? Out, Outside was, the yeah. Atlant Atlant not the Atlantis exhibit, in the Atlantis exhibit outside at, at, um, Atlantis, and she has examples of the patch or the 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 um, seeming work she has done for the shuttle. I've actually talked to her. I was like, this is a this is a small world moment right now with this whole experience. <laughs> so it gets smaller when I say to you, oh my gosh, we've thought of asking her to be a guest speaker. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and because we like to do a balance of women and men. Yeah, and yeah. I like to find people from all different backgrounds. So I think you've just given us the, uh, the, the will to go do that. <laughs> She's, it, it's, it, it's a, it's a aspect I didn't know existed in the construction of these launch vehicles, the shuttle in particular, and 
it was I was fascinated. I actually like I think I caught a glimpse of my me and my friend were there. I caught a glimpse of our wives kind of in the corner with their arms crossed. And that's when we decided we had to leave. But I would have stayed and talked to her longer if I, you know, given wow. the chance. No, great. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Oh, thank you. Um, if you want to hang around a bit, we're going to do two small segments. We oh, would kind to. of a magazine style. And yep. um, I know Denise is out there in the background. Um, Denise also works with us out at Muddy Run Observatory. And um, she's one of our telescope operators out there. She'll be working with the bubble project also. Um, Denise, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, we like to, we, oh, I see your titles back. Mistress of the universe. That's me. <laughs> Go ahead. Take it away, Denise. Thanks, Ted. Matt, that was great. Uh, I've always wanted to go to Kennedy Space Center, and I went down one time specifically to go there with my niece. She lives in Fort Myers or something, and we we're going to drive out there for the day, and um, she couldn't do it. <laughs> so basically went all the way to Florida and never got there. I was so upset. But uh, that park that you were talking about, that looks amazing. So I can't wait until... Yeah, that that is... if. Yeah, just to, not to keep the presentation going. That is that it, I, I think both go hand in hand. Um, I think I had a note and I missed it. I always take uh, my friends there after if we can do it in the same day after Kennedy Space Center. If not, then we'll do it the next day and then get dinner. It's 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 my new must see for my space yeah. enthusiast friends. Well, it looked great. So um, thank you for sharing us and telling us all those little cool tidbits. Right. That, treasures, absolute yeah, treasures. Exactly. Yes. So okay. Well, as we all know. Um, I do the planet report, so I'm going to share my screen and uh, just kind of show a couple of things. It's not going to be real long, so I'm going to share my desktop. And hopefully everybody can see everything. And I'm going to start down here with um, Sky Safari. And as we can see, I have it facing south. And over here, if we look in the kind of in the west, a little bit northwest, we got some good stuff happening. Finally, Venus is coming back. I'm so excited because uh, I can see it easier in the evening sky than in the morning. I miss it a lot. I sleep through it in the morning. But in the evening, it's usually pretty easy to go out when you're making dinner and look up and see Venus or what. And it just always looks so beautiful. So uh, over the next couple of nights, we have that and we have Mercury, which is going to hit its greatest elongation. Uh, hold on. I wrote it down just so I would remember because I forget the dates the 16th so sunday will be uh as far as mercury is going to get from the sun uh, for us to see it so it's going to be a good apparition which i love that word um Venus is obviously going to be brighter, but over the next couple of days, some fun stuff's going to happen. Uh, the moon is going to go by. Let me make sure I have this on. No, we don't want minutes. We want days. All right. Ted's much better with the sulfur than I am, but, uh, I'm going to try. So if we, if we go for the next couple of days, we see that the moon is going to be right next to Mercury tomorrow, and it's going to be a slither of a crescent. So it might be a little hard to find the moon, but uh, that might be a nice binocular pairing to look at. And then eventually, over the next couple of days, the moon is going to pass through Mars. Uh, well, not through Mars, but it's going to pass right by Mars. So we have Mercury, Venus, and Mars up in the early evening then we don't have really anything all night long we have to wait until the morning so let's go over here in the east let's switch this to minutes actually we could probably switch to hours and we'll, whoa sorry <laughs> sorry about that uh, let's go back to now so that was not good uh let's try minutes but uh, i'm going to do hours and then just step it rather than hit by myself so as you can see the days are getting longer so it's not dark until almost nine o'clock now so um best time to see mercury and venus is before then so if you, you might have a little bit of twilight uh that take take that into consideration maybe try and get to a little bit of a darker sky if you can uh and in the morning right after about two is our best time to see here we go down here jupiter saturn neptune Pluto, if you have, I'm sure Joe Steber has seen Pluto. In fact, I think, I, and I'm curious, has anyone else ever seen Pluto in a telescope? Ted? Yep. Not I'm impressive. Sure it was super exciting. <laughs> Not impressive at all. <laughs> I can imagine. In fact, I didn't even think it was. But <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah. So Pluto is up, uh, but uh, the the big ones are, are Saturn and Jupiter. And eventually, as we all know, with the Moon, if we go back to days, uh, the Moon will eventually 
fly right by it and it just did let's go back a little bit and uh, so the moon is going to follow the ecliptic and it will pass those morning planets as it heads into its waning phase now i want to keep on about the moon for one second but i'm going to get rid of sky so far we're going to quit that uh, our member bernie uh happened to catch the lunar x yeah. okay now this is like right but right around first quarter it's three craters and the rims of those craters you can see um, get illuminated by the sun and we have the lunar x now there's a lunar v up there somewhere but we'll save that for another uh topic but if you can see bernie's picture it's really prominent that's why i wanted to show his in particular because that's a great it just stands right out at you um so this is going to happen next week i think it's the 18th yep the 18th so tuesday night the best time is probably around 9 p.m to get your binocular if you have a nice high power binocular or a telescope check it out and if you're into photography you know great time buddy let's see those lunar x's and if you're really into uh lunar x you can also go to joe steber's web page and he has uh some nice pictures taken a few like many years ago 2009 uh where uh the lunar x is and here it is right there and on his page you can um swipe your mouse over it and it'll point out where the x is because it gets hard to find i mean this is a nice shot of it here but he takes it a couple days later after the moon has passed it's in its gibbous phase now and i have a hard time finding it but if you look at these two craters they kind of make an arc there's three of them they make an arc it's almost right in the center of the moon and right below that right down here is the x so yep try and find it that's your homework uh, for this month <laughs> try and find the so these three uh, craters they come down to these down here and that's where the x is and once again here it is right there on joe steber's page you can run your mouse over it and it'll tell you exactly where it is so uh, that is let's see sjastro.org and he's got a link for it right up at the top now there's one other thing with the moon this month and that is the lunar eclipse unfortunately we're not going to be able to see the lunar eclipse uh, you kind of have to be right in the middle of the pacific ocean uh, so unless you're like traveling around hawaii in that uh, out on a boat or a ship you're probably not going to see it from your house here. So uh, you're gonna have to look on the internet, but that is on the full moon and that is on the 26th. So um, let me just make sure I write all this stuff down so I don't forget it. Yep, total lunar eclipse, Pacific Ocean, 526, my notes. So um, that's it. Next month we have the solstice coming up. We have a solar eclipse coming up. Um, all kinds of good stuff to talk about and uh, maybe i'll do a light pollution demonstration that i just learned it's really cool so i'm saving it as a surprise so and hang it hang in here for a second denise because denise and i interviewed bernie and we did it live recently for a show at his retirement center and um, I relayed the story to Denise and Bernie how Milt Friedman, our previous president, probably made it a lifelong ambition to find this lunar X. <laughs> and he would look everywhere he goes. You have no idea how much he would chart it. He would plan it. He would look for the right times, try to figure out how to be out there and get a telescope out to see it. And I think maybe once in his entire career, he did finally get to see that. And we asked Bernie, what was involved? What was the preparation? And Bernie, <laughs> are you out there somewhere? Do you want to turn he your is. camera on? He's he is. Muted. Well, maybe he fell asleep, but Bernie says, dumb luck. <laughs> I just happened to be in the observatory and we're looking up there at the moon and there's the X right there. That's so, right. Oh, it's kind of amazing. You never know. And it's kind of neat. That's what keeps me observing all the time. You really never know what you're going to find or what you can explore through. Denise, very nice report tonight. Lots of planets up there. Um, I've been planets up early. In the evening, early evening, planets in the early morning. Yeah. And I'm an early morning guy. So I've been watching okay. Jupiter and Saturn. And, and remember, I'm watching them get further and further apart. Yes. Um, in fact, Saturn is going to head retrograde. Uh, in, I think it's actually still tonight. And then it's going to look like it's appearing to move backwards because we all talked about um for those of you who aren't here at the end of the year they came into conjunction last year in december they were yep. just at sunset and right together in the sky well i've been watching now for the last couple of months because in the morning it's so cool to just watch them now go further and further away so thanks denise that was a very nice job you're welcome 
And uh, Dave, I know you've been resisting, probably jump in during our talk here because Dave's our rocket science man. And I know he's going down to Florida and I'm looking at some of the posts that he made there and he has a couple spots, but Dave, you learned a new location or two, didn't you? Yeah, it's funny. We're always good down with relatives and hit the same spots. I can't think of how many you know days I've spent on Jetty Park Beach, but I never knew about the space park. There you go. And you uh, we used to rent, rent a uh, time, my uncle rented a timeshare where from one of the balconies, when the weather was clear, you could see the VAB across from the uh, cruise ship basin. Wow. Well, Dave does our rocket so, science. Yeah, that report. was really cool, Matt. Great presentation. I am so envious of your opportunities right now. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so take it away, Dave. Do a little rocket science with us tonight. Yeah, I'm going to try and keep it brief. There's been a lot of great stuff going on. Uh, unlike Matt, who lives near where lots of rockets are going on, I have to content myself with being an armchair rocket scientist. <laughs> So I'll keep everybody up on the latest news this week with our rocket report. Ingenuity, Jenny, that cute little helicopter on Mars has exceeded expectations. In fact, they're now moving above and beyond its original goals and they're now actually using it to test uh, as a scout for the rover. It's not really doing it for curiosity right now, but it, I'm sorry, perseverance right now. Boy, so many rovers these days. We got too active on the surface, but they're actually testing its ability to fly away from the rover, scout out landing spots, scout out interesting features, send pictures back. And on the 15th of May, it landed in the first place on Mars that was not its original launch site named Wright Field. Its furthest flight has been 129 meters, which doesn't sound much here on Earth, but on Mars in that ultra thin atmosphere, that's quite the feat. A little closer to home, China has been busy launching the Tianhe. My pronunciation's awful. Of all the languages I speak, Chinese is probably the least uh, fluent. The Tianhe Space Station Corps. And this is a drawing of what it's going to look like when the full station is up. They're planning on about four human flights so far to put it together. But the central core, it might look a bit familiar. Hey, Dave. It's you're, based you're not on the screen. These... Share your screen, oh. Dave. <laughs> sorry. Okay, this one's, hang on. I thought I hit share. Sorry. All good. Sorry, sorry. There we go. Nope. Oh, it's coming up now. There we go. Thank you. That's it. There we go. Well, I'll backtrack. That 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 that's a cute cute picture of uh, Jenny there flying away on Mars, taken from the uh, rover. But here's Tianhe. This is what it's supposed to look like when it is done. The core module is going to look very similar. It's based on the Soviet, uh, or sorry, Russian uh, Zvezda module that is the core of the International Space Station. It's going to take about four human flights to build it up. And we can see some of the planned add-ons, including the Shenzhou Soyuz-based manned capsule and the Almaz-based cargo capsule. Almaz is also part of the International Space Station, but they renamed it in the ever-so-romantic functional cargo block. So we'll keep an eye on them. Uh, the US will not participate in a Chinese space station due to political complications. So it will be interesting to see how this space station race goes out in the future. The Tianhe Harmony in the Heavens core lock was launched on a Changze 5B rocket, uh, Long March 5. And its core stage is one of their first hydrogen oxygen based stages with four kerosene and oxygen based boosters. Uh, it's very similar to our old Atlas launcher in that the core stage is sort of a sustainer and it actually makes it all the way to orbit after it drops off those four boosters. You probably heard it in the news because they didn't have control of it once it reached low Earth orbit and released its payload, which means this large booster the size of a Falcon 9 or a Russian Proton or a Atlas IV Heavy 
was spinning out of control and nobody knew when and how it would come down. Here's a picture of it coming down as it's dive bombing the Maldives on Sunday, May 9th. And it didn't hit anyone, but it did go over several areas. And if we remember last year, the same sort of booster came down on the Ivory Coast in Africa. No one was hurt, but a lot of people are concerned. You know, we've had some big stuff come down, Skylab, et cetera, but we planned on it coming down in controlled fashion, but we were late. They are not seeming, I'm gonna be a little political here, they don't seem to be really caring about where their boosters come down right now. Maybe the world space community can put a bit of pressure on them. But let's go to the good news. Our crews were being on ISS in addition to their prepackaged fruit, food and occasional stuff that comes up fresh on uh, resupply missions, have been growing their own veggies in space. A couple of different programs. One is the vegetable production system nicknamed Veggie and the Advanced Plant Habitat. And the astronauts actually get to eat some of these vegetables to complement their meals. The rest comes back to Earth for nutritional analysis, but it's safe. And if we're going to do long duration space missions, we're going to have to grow food in space. Speaking of space stations, uh, last week there was a rare, rare occurrence, actually a unique occurrence in the history of the space station. For the first time, two crewed United States capsules, or spacecraft, of any sort were docked to the space station. Crew One Dragon launched a couple of months ago and the Endeavour docked on 24 April 2021. And now the, oh, whoops, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. Got that wrong, I'm looking at my notes here. Endeavour, Endeavour docked back in April it's the second flight to the space station. The first one was a demo flight, but it was also the first time other than the space shuttle that a reused vehicle has docked with the space station. It was preceded by the capsule crew one resilience. And you can see that on the picture that both docked here. They actually had to move over on the right hand side. They actually had to move resilience to open up a docking port. There were 11 people on the space station, which is pretty much capacity. People had to sleep in storage areas. So we can see their parking spots are pretty full. It's like Christmas at the mall up there right now. Resilience landed back on in the ocean back on the 1st of May in the first nighttime splashdown since Apollo 8 back in 1968. So uh, SpaceX, they're kicking it. We've got crew dragons carrying four caps four people each up and down and much roomier and much more capable than the older Soyuz that we've been relying on since the space shuttle retired. Okay. What else is going on up there? Well, speaking of SpaceX, they made another achievement in addition to having two capsules at the space station. Uh, on Sunday, they launched booster B1051 number 10 on its 10th flight. That was a big goal is to get my picture disappeared. It was a Starlink launch, but that was the 10th reuse without major refurbishment of one of the Falcon 9 boosters, and they recovered it. And they're talking about pushing one of these things until they finally figure out how many times they can launch before it fails in service, hopefully with their own payloads well insured. It launched the 60 Starlink satellites, and then SpaceX did something incredibly, incredibly disappointing. SpaceX Starship serial number 15 took off from Boca Chica, Texas, right near the Mexican border, flew to an altitude of 10 kilometers, did its famous belly flop maneuver, and unfortunately landed without blowing up, flipping over, or taking off again on a short flight to oblivion. It landed right next to the under construction SN-16. So they're pretty brave. I mean, they're pretty close together there. So they don't seem to be afraid of breaking things. There is some question about whether they're going to relaunch SN-15 to prove its reusability or retire it and do reusability tests with 16, 17, or 18 coming up in the future. And they've made such an impression, I'm sure you've all heard, 
that NASA has chosen them as one of the options for our future lunar landing. Artist conception, we're not there yet, but we'll see. They have a good track record. They seem to be outpacing the competition. And this is Dave Walker saying, for this week, that's what's up. Thank you, Dave. Come Thank here, you, Mouse. Dave. Stop, share. Thanks, Dave. <laughs>